Welcome to this online lesson asking the question, was the New Model Army Britain's first professional army? This lesson will look at the era of the English Civil War and the establishment of Parliament's successful New Model Army. But it will also consider the techniques of fighting in this war and how Parliament improved training, discipline and leadership to eventually win. The aims are to know how armies changed between 1500 and 1650, to explain how armies changed between 1500 and 1650, and ultimately to evaluate the reasons for change between those dates. But first of all, let's get a key word down. The key word today is professional. This means to be doing something as a main paid job, or being an expert at something. So really what we're asking here is, was Parliament's new model army expert and being paid to do it as their main job, rather than doing it as part-timers? Pause the video here and note down today's title and the key word and its definition. Press play when you're ready to continue. Firstly, let's get some context. This will be particularly helpful if you've not yet studied the English Civil War or if you've missed any lessons on it. But it may well be useful for revision too, so pay attention to this bit and do the quick summary task at the end too. Very simply, the first English Civil War between 1642 and 1649 was a war over who should have power between King Charles I and his royalist or cavalier supporters, and Parliament and their parliamentarian or roundhead supporters. Charles I believed that God made him king so he didn't have to listen to the advice of others. He called this divine right. This brought him into conflict with Parliament who demanded power in return for raising taxes for the king. As a result, Charles I tried to arrest five members of Parliament by entering the House of Commons, and this was illegal. Funnily enough, it's still illegal for the Queen to enter the House of Commons now. Both sides raised armies, and the fighting and chaos that ensued became proportionally the bloodiest war in British history. Most of the fighting was in England, and key battles included Edge Hill in 1642, Marston Moor in 1644, both of which we're going to look at within this lesson, but also Naseby in 1645 and even Great Torrington in 1646. By 1646, Parliament's armies led by Oliver Cromwell and Sir Thomas Fairfax had beaten Charles and placed him under arrest. He was later put on trial for treason, found guilty and beheaded. More of that in the subsequent lesson. Ever since, Parliament has had more power than the monarch. Here are your quick notes then. Write down the name of the war, then make accurate quick notes on who was involved, why did the war start, where were the key battles, when did it happen, and what were the results. Press pause and make your notes now, and press play when you're ready to continue. Done? Let's move on. We're now going to have a look at Civil War armies, how they were equipped, how they were trained, but also how they fought. This will lead into what the New Model Army did to improve this situation. There are three main types of soldier in the English Civil War, organised into regiments of foot, the infantry, and regiments of horse, the cavalry. There were other types of troops too, like the artillery who fired cannon, and dragoons who basically fought as foot soldiers but arrived in battle on horses, but they weren't true cavalry. But to simplify things, let's just consider these basic three. By the end of the war in 1646, the parliamentarians had built up a professional force, or arguably a professional force, called the New Model Army. This was led by Sir Thomas Fairfax and Oliver Cromwell. First of all though, let's get some details on the different types of soldier. Let's start by having a look at a typical cavalryman. Although both sides used cavalry, and they had very similar equipment and weapons, the drawing that I've done here better represents a parliamentarian uh, cavalryman from the late war period. Nevertheless, this will illustrate cavalry quite well for either side. The advantages of the cavalry was that their horse gave them great speed and mobility and a height advantage over usual foot soldiers, so they can attack foot soldiers without pikes and spears and other cavalry. However, their Achilles heel is attacking foot soldiers who are organised and who have pike or spear formations. Horses are not stupid, they don't like running into pointed spikes, and so by organising pikes in a formation can effectively keep the horses at a distance. But if infantry are caught disorganised and out in the open, then the cavalry can wreak havoc upon them. You can make a note now of the pros and cons of the cavalry. Pause the video while you do that. Let's have a look at the equipment of the cavalry. Again, you can note these things down, or possibly you can even annotate a version of this picture yourself, especially if you've been provided with one. If not, maybe you'd like to draw your own. 
The most obvious piece of equipment that the cavalryman has, other than his horse, is his sword. This would be his primary weapon. Cavalry also carried two pistols with one shot each. However, these were incredibly slow and cumbersome to reload, so typically they could not be reloaded whilst in the saddle. So that's only one shot each. So you'd choose to shoot them very, very carefully, either to get yourself out of a tight spot or to attack some soldiers that you couldn't otherwise get close enough to, perhaps ones carrying a pike. The horse itself provides great speed and mobility. These horses were proper war horses. They were trained to kick and bite, as well as just providing movement and transport for the soldier. And lastly, the cavalry were quite well armoured. This particular cavalryman is armoured with a lobster tail helmet and a light breastplate for body armour. Underneath this would be a heavy leather coat as well, which would further provide some sort of protection. If you're going to make notes around your own copy of this picture, pause the video now. Let's have a look at the next soldier type. The Musketeer. It looks like the Musketeer is smoking a cigarette, but he's not. We'll come back to that. The advantage of the Musketeer is that they can attack foot soldiers at a distance. However, their disadvantage is that they're weak against fast cavalry and their gun is very inaccurate. This is largely because the gun doesn't have a long range, is very inaccurate at any sort of range, and is very, very slow to reload. It's also quite tricky to reload as well. Key features of the Musketeer is that they do not have any armour. No armour of the period could defeat a musket ball, so it was very pointless wearing it. However, it was better to be without armour and have greater mobility and comfort, and so they didn't bother. The Musketeer would carry small bottles of gunpowder. Each one was enough for one shot. Twelve were typically carried, and they were nicknamed the Apostles, like Jesus' twelve Apostles. They were also armed with a matchlock musket, with a range of about 100 metres. The matchlock was set off with a piece of match cord. This was a smouldering, smoking piece of string or rope that would set off the gunpowder charge. Not like a modern trigger mechanism at all. More dangerous, more unreliable, and more difficult to use. So, pause the video here. Make your notes around your picture of the musketeer, if you have one and make a note of the pros and cons as well. So the advantages are in green, the disadvantages are in red. Pause the video while you do this. Musketeers would typically make their own ammunition from scrap pieces of lead. Here, molten lead would be heated on a fire, tipped into the mould and made into a musket ball. Where the lead was poured in would leave a bump or sprue, which could be snipped off with the tool. However, these musket balls are not like modern bullets. They are not aerodynamic, and they would be quite loose-fitting in the musket, which all contributes to their inaccuracy. But they were tremendously powerful, larger in fact than modern bullets are. And if they hit their target, that was usually game over for the poor soldier who was hit. Our last soldier type is the pikeman the most heavily armed and armoured person on the Civil War battlefield. In fact, when I drew this picture, I did it on a standard A4 piece of paper, and I ran out of space for the pike because it is so long. So what I've done is I've drawn the pikeman holding his pike at a charge position, and in the background I've shown what the end of the pike would look like. If you added those two lengths together, it would give you an idea of the length of the pike overall. The advantages of the pikeman are as follows. They were very effective defence against the cavalry, Horses didn't much like the idea of running into those spikes, especially when they were levelled at the height of a horse's head. And so they can defend the musketeers against cavalry attack. They can also attack other foot soldiers, but that is more likely to re result in a draw, unless one side is particularly more disciplined or stronger than the others. However, the disadvantage is really down to their weight and the cumbersome nature of their weaponry. They were in huge slow formations with a long heavy pike, and that makes pikemen very vulnerable to musket fire. As they move slowly across the battlefield, the muskets have got plenty of time to reload their guns and shoot at a large formation of men who can't really dodge away. Make a, a note of these different advantages and disadvantages now, and pause the video while you do so. Now let's make a few notes as to their equipment. You can add these to your own copy of a pikeman, or maybe you'd like to draw your own. They are well armoured with a helmet, backplate and breastplate. And they are armed with a small sword called a tuck. 
This would allow them to have a secondary method of defence if their pike became lost or broken. But also, while they're holding the pike with one hand, perhaps when defending against horses, they could cover gaps between the pikes with their sword as well. The pike itself was the most impressive bit of kit that they carried. It was 16 feet long, or 5 metres long. It was tipped with a long steel spike, which could do devastating damage to other soldiers, and particularly to horses. Pause the video while you note down the equipment of the pikemen. Here's an example of a Civil War breastplate. You might be able to see the dent in the front of it. Here's another example. Again, it's got a dent. Well, most Civil War armour you would find has these dents. They're known as proof marks. It's where the armourer would test the quality of their, their armour by firing a pistol ball at it. If the pistol ball ricocheted off, then the armour was of sufficient quality and the person would be more likely to buy it. However, a pistol ball is a very different proposition to a musket ball. Here we can see a piece of armour which has been shot with two musket balls. As you can see, the musket balls have easily punched right through. Again, underlining how vulnerable the pikemen were to the musket attack. We're now going to consider Civil War battle tactics. These are surprisingly easy to understand. In fact, if you can understand the game of rock, paper, scissors, then you can understand Civil War battle tactics. Here's why. In this classic game, the paper beats the rock because it wraps it up. The rock beats the scissors because it blunts the blades. And the scissors beat the paper because it cuts it. If you can understand that process, then you can understand the way that Civil War battles work, believe it or not. Here's why. In a Civil War battle, the cavalry are fast and mobile. They can beat the muskets, which cannot fire fast enough to take down enough cavalry to save themselves. However, the muskets can shoot at a distance. Therefore, they can take down the slow-moving pikemen. And lastly, the slow-moving pikemen, with their organised spear formations, can stop the cavalry. So, just like rock, paper, scissors, the cavalry beats the muskets, the muskets beat the pikes, and the pikes beat the cavalry. Simple. Well, it is in a sense. But it is much more difficult to control your men in battle once it starts, and when people start panicking. But ideally, you would try and protect your muskets with the pikes, and try and protect your, your pikes with your muskets, and the cavalry would try to exploit any weak spots in the enemy formations. So let's consider the quality of armies and leaders in the early English Civil War. In the next slide, you're going to see what happened at the first battle of the Civil War. On the 23rd of October, 1642, 30,000 men and 5,000 men with horses, the cavalry, met at a place called Edge Hill. The whole argument between King and Parliament was meant to be settled in an afternoon, but it wasn't. We're going to observe what happened, and you're going to have to be ready to give your opinion as to why nobody won the Battle of Edge Hill. Here we can see I've drawn a very basic version of the battlefield at Edge Hill. Yes, this is drawn in Microsoft Paint and it's not very good, but it'll give you an idea of the layout. The King's Army is shown in blue, and it was larger than Parliament's. And the Parliamentarian Army is shown in red. I've also used a key to try and give you an idea of where the different troops were, uh, were positioned, but this is only to give you a rough idea and shouldn't be taken as absolutely exact. Pike formations are shown as large rectangles. Muskets are shown as triangles. These two types of soldier were by far the most common on the battlefield. For simplicity's sake, I've left off the artillery. Cavalry is shown as little chess pieces. And the dragoons? Well, you should view those as being other muskets, really. But they did arrive on horseback and had slightly more mobility. But we shouldn't compare them to true cavalry, because they weren't trained in the same way, and they definitely weren't equipped to fight in the same way. At this stage, we're going to have a look at the main events of the battle. It would be useful for you to quickly jot down the main events and pause the video while you do so. Afterwards, that'll help you answer the questions. The first main event of the battle was that Prince Rupert of the Rhine, who was the a nephew to King Charles, decided to charge at the parliamentarians without any particular orders. This probably annoyed Charles, but it seemed to have a good effect for the royalists. Sir so Faithful Fortescue panicked and changed sides. Prince Rupert then chased the remaining cavalry off the field. Sir so Faithful seems to be very poorly named. It's not a very faithful thing to do to change sides in the middle of a battle. 
Pause the video here and make a note of what's happened so far. It was a poor move when Prince Rupert charged off the battle. He had decided that the battle was just about won and that he needed to play no further part in it. So he disappeared off to the village of Kyneton where his men looted the parliamentarian baggage train. There are even reports that some of them got quite drunk. The point is that they paid no further part in the battle. Pause the video again and make a note of the fact that the Prince Rupert of the Rhine has just left the battlefield. So, Charles seems to have got a much weaker army now. Let's see what happens next. Demonstrating just how difficult it was to control an army in battle, on the left-hand side, Sir Henry Wilmot charged. Again, Parliament's badly led cavalry legged it. But, unlike Prince Rupert, Sir Henry Wilmot is going to return to his lines. Pause the video here and make another note of what happens next. Now you can make a note that Sir Henry Wilmot has returned to the Royalist lines, which was probably quite a wise move. So, so far, it looks like the Royalists are winning. Much of the cavalry on the Parliamentarian side has been beaten. So surely Charles is at the point of making the rest of the Parliamentarian army panic. Except it didn't really end like that. At this point, Charles was sensing victory and he sent his larger army in to advance. But this was a bad move. They should have stayed on Edge Hill, which was a really strong defensive position. But they sacrificed that advantage. As you can see, the balance between pikes and muskets is fairly even in this battle, and so neither side is likely to give way before the other. At long last, Parliament made a move. But first of all, pause the video here and note down that Charles has sent in his force for a frontal attack. At this stage, Parliament's remaining cavalry and dragoons, remember these are men with guns fighting on horseback, cut off Charles' army. This meant that they were virtually surrounded, and they had begun to receive musket fire from the rear, and they were afraid of what effect the cavalry would have on them. And so, something strange happens in a moment. But first, pause the video and note down that Parliament have made an attempt to surround the King's army. Finally then, both sides see that nobody could win in this situation. Charles doesn't have enough cavalry, and the Earl of Essex loses his nerve. Both sides withdrew. Make a note of that now as well, and pause the video while you do so. Ultimately then, the Battle of Edge Hill in 1642 is indecisive. Nobody wins. Let's do some follow-up tasks based upon that. Taking the example of the Battle of Edge Hill, bad leadership and poor training is the reason the war went on so long in the first place. Parliament didn't know how to control a battle at this point, but neither did Charles. Prince Rupert, while a good soldier, was more interested in stealing from the enemy than winning. So here's your question. Describe two features of poor training and leadership in the Battle of Edge Hill in 1642. This will take you about four sentences, where you give the examples of poor training and leadership, and perhaps explain as well the effect that it had on the outcome of the battle. Pause the video while you complete that task. So hopefully we've identified that poor discipline on the part of Prince Rupert and indeed the, the, uh, the fact that the cavalry often charged without orders shows that there was a lack of discipline on King Charles's side. Similarly, Sir Faithful Fortescue deserting his cause and the other cavalry retreating shows that there was little discipline on Parliament's side as well. And finally, neither side having particular good control of the battle meant that when they all withdrew, it ended in a draw. A real big mess with hundreds of men dead for no advantage. The New Model Army. Add this as a new subheading. The New Model Army was Parliament's attempt to improve the army that had lost so many battles early in the war. It was led by Sir Thomas Fairfax, who's pictured at the top there, and Oliver Cromwell, who's incredibly famous and you may have heard of him. You might expect that Cromwell would be in overall command of the New Model Army. Perhaps he should have been. But a law passed by Parliament forbidding members of Parliament from taking command in the army meant that this wasn't possible, at least not at first. But there was a good reason for this. Parliament was trying to move away from the idea that men of influence, power and landowning should be the ones to command the army. And there was a lot of sense in this. Clearly so far, the existing leaders of the army hadn't been doing a very good job. 
Parliament decided to restructure its army so that they become, could, might become even more effective. This army was to be a completely new model, hence the name New Model Army. So if you were thinking of toy soldiers, you were wrong. It would be led by these two proven commanders, Thomas Fairfax and Oliver Cromwell. We're going to consider the features of this army and whether or not it was professional. So what might be their priorities? In order to understand how Parliament structured, trained and used the new model army, we're going to create a mind map. Here's how it will look. Firstly, in the middle, you need the main heading, which is what was the new model army like? Then we're going to have a section on its strength. We're going to have a section on money. We're going to have a section on the training of the new model army and also a section on weapons. If you'd like an extra challenge, here's one to consider. What problems might the new model army still have faced? I've shortened new model army to NMA here, but actually that's not a usually used. I've simply run out of space on this screen, so you should really write it in full. Pause the video while you create an, your own mind map like this. You might simply do it as a list, or you could create it on a piece of paper laid out in a similar way to what I've done on screen here. Whatever you choose, pause the video and get your section sorted. We're going to have a look at different facts about the new model army now. For the first ones, you're going to have to sort out the facts into these different sections. So the initial priorities of the new model army were as follows. You're going to add these factors to the appropriate parts of your mind map. And then as a challenge, if you have time, what element or elements would Parliament not realistically achieve? Perhaps because they were simply too difficult under wartime conditions. So Parliament wanted the new model army to be, in an ideal world, properly and regularly paid. Now that might seem like an obvious one, but very often armies at this time were simply forced to fight rather than being paid for their services. They should be well clothed with a red uniform. Previously, each regiment had its own coloured jacket, or often men just wore their own clothes. They were rewarded with money and promotions for good conduct. They could be punished for mistakes and bad behaviour. And they would be preferably Puritan, which is a very strict type of Protestant Christian. So pause the video here and add these different elements to your mind map. We're then going to look in more detail at each section in turn. But pause the video for now while you complete that. So, regular pay should go under the money section. Red uniform might be under training and discipline, but also it might be under money because they had to pay for it. In fact, the red uniform of the British Army today dates back to this time. Why choose red? Well, if you've ever been told that it's because blood blends in with it, it's a load of old nonsense. Red was considered quite a lucky colour at the time, but more to the point, it was the cheapest colour available. Rewards with money and promotions for good conduct should go under training and discipline, but might also have links to money. Punishment for mistakes and bad behaviour should definitely go under training and discipline. And being preferably Puritan? Well, I'll leave that one up to you. Perhaps that's one that wouldn't realistically be achieved. Let's have a look at strength now. You're going to need to add at least three specific real examples to your mind map from the following information. More if you can manage it. The new model army was led by proving commanders, Sir Thomas Fairfax, who was the overall commander, and Oliver Cromwell, who was commander of the cavalry. In it, there were 22,000 men in total, and of these, there were 6,600 cavalry and 14,400 foot soldiers. These are the musketeers and pikemen. 1,000 were dragoons, somewhere between the cavalry and musketeers. The cavalry were mostly volunteers committed to the parliamentarian fight, but most of the infantry remained pressed men. These are men who were forced to fight, but at least they would get some pay if the new model army managed to get its organisation right. The officers, the men in charge, were no longer given their jobs based upon how rich or posh they were. They had to prove that they were good at their jobs. This is known as a meritocracy, where people are rewarded for their good conduct and for their skills. Pause the video now while you add at least three specific examples to your mind map. You might be able to find examples here that actually go beyond the strength section. You can draw lines between the sections to indicate this. Pause the video while you complete this task. On to the next section. Money. One immediate priority was to ensure that the men in the army were loyal and satisfied with their treatment. This made it less likely that they were going to run away and desert. It would also ensure good morale or good happiness among the soldiers. 
the new model army was properly and regularly paid. Eight pence a day for foot soldiers, which was not great, but it was decided upon because this was the average wage for a labourer. It was at least reliable though, so they should be able to buy themselves some food and they should be able to buy themselves some lodgings if this wasn't provided for them. However, the cavalry were paid substantially more, two shillings or 24 pence a day for the cavalry. But there's a reason for this. It was good pay, but cavalry had to provide their own food and horses, which was a very expensive expenditure for them. This might not seem much overall, but food and clothing was generally provided to the infantry as well as the money, but there were strict punishments if they stole from the local population. After all, Parliament was trying to get the support of more people in England, and stealing soldiers were a great way to lose support. They were also issued with red jackets as a uniform, the first time a standardised uniform was used for a British army. Pause the video now while you complete this. You will need at least three specific examples again. Before we move on, look for any links with other sections of your diagram. You can indicate these with dashed lines. Next section, weapons. This is a shorter section. The main weapons remain pikes, matchlock muskets and cavalry with swords and pistols, as we've seen earlier in this lesson. Parliament's good reserves of money meant that plenty was spent on making these weapons the best quality available. Ammunition, lead and gunpowder, was plentiful for the musketeers and artillery. Armour was improved, especially for the cavalry, who became known as Ironsides because of the strength of their armour, equipment and their determination in battle. We can see a, an example of high status armour for a cavalryman in the picture on the right. Again, look to include three specific examples to your mind map now and pause the video while you do this. Ready to move on? Let's go on to the last section. Training and discipline. Satisfied, well-fed and well-paid soldiers tend to be more disciplined, which means that they're more likely to follow orders. This is because they don't need to free quarter, which means steal and loot to get money and food. Remember, this is exactly what Prince Rupert's men did at the Battle of Edge Hill. They feel that they are well treated, so they're loyal to their cause. The new model army was better trained too, so it felt more confident of their own and their commander's abilities in battle. Discipline was shown on the battlefield. Cromwell trained the cavalry personally. He didn't let his cavalry chase enemies off the field, they stayed put, charging repeatedly until the battle was won. So for this final section, pause the video while you note down at least three specific examples. Done? Well, if you're feeling brave, perhaps you could have a go at the extension part. Are there any problems that the new model army haven't yet solved? We're now going to consider a second battle of the Civil War. In truth, Parliament's new model army reforms hadn't yet been completed by 1644 when the Battle of Marston Moor was fought. However, some improvements such as discipline and leadership were already improving. So let's see how this battle goes. Again, blocks of pikes are shown by rectangles, muskets are shown by triangles, and the cavalry are shown by these chess pieces again. One thing I should point out is that the ditch in the middle was a large field drainage ditch which the royalists had kind of improved to make it difficult for cavalry to cross. I've had to make this in something of a hurry, so the animations are not even up to my usual low standards, they're even worse, which means that you will see cavalry darting across this ditch. In reality, they would have had to have gone round, so just use your imagination a little bit there. Like we did with the Battle of Edge Hill, pause the video where you need to make a note of what was done in the, each stage of the battle. So let's have a look at what happened first. The first event was that Lord Byron's cavalry charged at Oliver Cromwell. And Oliver Cromwell beat Lord Byron's cavalry. It's important to point out that Prince Rupert, who was in charge of the Royalist army at Nunmarston Moor, did not order this to happen. A bit of a taste of his own medicine after his behaviour at Edge Hill, you might argue. Prince Rupert counterattacked Cromwell, who returned to his lines before he could be dealt with. So let's make a note of our first event. Lord Byron's cavalry charged without being ordered to, and Cromwell easily beat them. Pause the video while you record that. Next. Lord Goring's cavalry charged at Sir Thomas Fairfax. Fairfax was an excellent cavalryman, but so was Goring, and Fairfax was at this point outnumbered. 
Fairfax was supposed to be in overall charge of the battle, but now he was unable to give orders, being engaged in a fight for his life. So let's record event number two. Goring cavalry charged at Fairfax, Parliament's cavalry were outnumbered and now fighting for their lives. Pause the video while you do this. At this point, you might be surprised by what happens next. It might appear that the Royalist musketeers are unprotected and so vulnerable to cavalry charges. But remember that ditch out the front. That's going to, at the very least, slow down cavalry charges or stop them altogether. So the idea is that they can lay down a heavy weight of fire as parliamentarian infantry tried to cross this ditch. But cross it they did. Parliament realised that they had a larger army and that yes, sometimes in a battle it is necessary to deliberately sacrifice your soldiers for a greater end. They knew that they would take losses covering the field and crossing the ditch, but Parliament's men were prepared to take this. They were, after all, better trained and disciplined. Also, one can only imagine how angry they were having seen some of their comrades shot as they crossed the field. A fierce hand-to-hand -hand fight ensued as they crossed the ditch. While all this was going on, Cromwell was noticing that Fairfax was losing the battle against Goring. First of all, though, let's just note down event number three. Cromwell, now in charge of the battle, ordered all of his army to charge. There were too many men for the Royalist muskets to stop. Pause the video while you record this key detail. The eagle-eyed among you might have noticed a gap in Prince Rupert's line. While it might seem obvious for Oliver Cromwell to charge at Goring from the side, Goring was expecting this, and it is likely that the moment Cromwell did this, Goring would have retreated and backed up the Royalist army. So Cromwell came up with a cunning plan. Here's what he did. Cromwell's cavalry charged through a gap in Prince Rupert's lines and then attacked Goring from a direction that he simply wasn't expecting. Panicked and now outnumbered, Goring fled the battlefield. Sir Thomas Fairfax had been saved. Seeing that his army was being overwhelmed, that much of his cavalry had now run away and the rest was not really in a position to intervene, Prince Rupert of the Rhine, the person who had fled the battlefield himself, or rather run away to try and steal from the enemy, ordered a disciplined retreat. So let's note down event number four. Cromwell rode right around the Royalist army, surprising Goring and rescuing Fairfax. Pause the video while you get that down. And then lastly, let's record the fact that seeing his cavalry had run away, his men were beaten, Rupert ordered his army to retreat. Clearly Rupert had learnt some of the lessons of the Battle of Edge Hill, but not all of his army had. Pause the video while you write down the fifth and final event. So ultimately, the Battle of Marston Moor in 1644 was a parliamentarian victory. Their reforms, while not complete, were clearly starting to have an effect. The Royalists were defeated, and they had no longer had any real power in the north of England. So finally, describe one way that Parliament's army was better disciplined than the Royalists at Marston Moor. You might want to refer to your notes to do this. Secondly, explain why Oliver Cromwell showed such good leadership at Marston Moor. And lastly, in your opinion, consider all of the notes that you've taken today, write a structured answer. Was the new model army a professional army? You will need to say whether or not you think it was a professional army, support that opinion with at least one specific example, and explain why that specific example proves your point. Point, example, explain. Pause the video while you complete those tasks. Ultimately, Parliament's new model army was better disciplined at the Battle of Marston Moor. For example, when the infantry attacked, they were prepared to take losses and carry on the fight. Similarly, Fairfax's cavalry did not run away when they were outnumbered, they fought it out until help arrived. Cromwell showed good leadership by taking initiative. He ordered the army to attack when he realised that Fairfax was no longer in a position to do so, and he also led his men brilliantly. While he saw Lord Byron's men off the field, he returned to his own lines to resume command. And then when he saw the opportunity with a gap in Prince Rupert's lines, he charged through around the outside of the Royalist army and attacked Goring from behind, saving Fairfax's life. Lastly, was the new model army a professional army? 
most historians would agree that in many respects, yes, it was. Not as professional as a truly modern army as they were still relying on people who were not necessarily volunteers but forced to do it. But the intentions were all there. Disciplined, with a uniform, doing it as a full-time full job, not just a part-time job, and doing it for pay. These men were expert fighters. And a big part of the reason why Parliament ended up winning the English Civil War. I hope that this has been useful and interesting to you. If it has, and if you're able to do so, give the video a like, and maybe make a comment as well. But always subscribe to the channel if you want to find uh, more lessons of this type. There'll be more content uploaded soon. Thanks very much for watching, and goodbye.